Welcome to Pathways, a career podcast from the Idaho State University Career Center. I'm your host, Mark Beaver. Today, we're talking with Dr. Michael Stubbs, Senior Lecturer in English at Idaho State University. Michael has had the desire, the notion, to be a writer for about as long as he can remember, though he had kind of a hard time understanding how to get there until he started really finding the balance in his life. Please join us for a conversation to learn about what it is to be a senior lecturer and how to find balance to inform your creative life. Hey, Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for coming in. So you are a senior lecturer in English uh, here at ISU, and a couple of reasons I was looking forward to speaking with you is um, I've never had anyone from the English department before. Um, but two, I also, part of my job is that I uh, do kind of like recruiting for AmeriCorps, and a lot of that is for like Conservation Corps, so people getting out, um, doing trail work in the back country, um, even doing some kind of like uh, fuels reduction work like that. And I, early on when I was here, a English professor came by a table and said, this would be awesome for our English students. We're really trying to push like getting experience, you know, in different ways to, to compliment, to complement your, your progression as, as a writer or, or a student. Um, so I've also been told that you have some of these balances in your life as well, and we can get into those, but, um, I guess just first off, can you tell me a little bit about like what, what's a, a bird's eye view of kind of a day to day of the senior lecturer? All right. Well, I'm probably atypical, but because um, I spend a lot of my time running and <laughs> doing things out of the office. Um, in the office, I think, so lecturers uh, primarily are hired to teach. Mm -hmm. So we teach uh, a lot of the first year writing classes, second year writing classes, and then um, some of the, uh, depending on kind of our areas of expertise, we might end up teaching tech writing or business writing. I teach 1101 and 1102, so the first two semesters of writing. I used to teach a lot of literature classes, but as the English major has kind of shrunk over the years, there's fewer literature classes mm -hmm. available, so I don't get to see those as often. Um, but every once in a while, I'll still get to teach one of those. So a lot of time in the classroom, um, the professors are hired to, to research and to teach. Lecturers are not hired to do research. So we spend, we could say, like less time in the library, more time in the classroom, and then a lot of time grading. So four classes, you know, four different classes per semester because it's the first year writing class and second year writing class, lots and lots of grading. Yeah. <laughs> so lots of time at the desk. Right. And I assume that's a lot of reading as well, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't have that kind of the research and, and service side maybe of, of like a of a like the faculty member per se, but it's all focused on the classroom. Uh, we do have uh, there is a service component to our oh, contract okay. as well, so we will be on committees. Plenty of service, yeah. So Good. meeting with committees, helping write curriculum, helping write policies, helping uh, choose the textbooks, things like that. But more contracted time in the classroom or a higher grading load because the the first year and second year writing classes have more students in them than upper division literature classes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, research is not a required component of uh, my contract. At the, how many years have you been doing this? Uh, full time, I think 11 oh, years, okay. 11 or 12. How much time then? So obviously you have a lot of time reading and grading. Mm -hmm. um, I have a class that I teach that I don't have that much writing involved and, but, but it does take up when, when I do have those assignments, I mean, it takes up a lot of my time, even with just like five to 10 students. Yeah. That's has to take up a pretty fair amount of your time in that position. Obviously, how much time do you have to put into kind of like the prep for these classes at this point, 11 years in? Yeah. 11 years in less time than, at, uh, when I started, when I started, I think prep took. I, it felt it feels like prep took most of my time, especially when I was a graduate student, and even just teaching one class, I ended up spending a lot of time prepping. Mm -hmm. And I think because I put in a lot of that time early, 
um, I can put in a little bit less now. Right. Um, I do revise my classes every couple of years. I'll switch books. I'll ch change writing assignments. I'll, ch I'll change reading assignments. But that feels less burdensome than it used to. But when I started, I felt like I was always playing catch up, you know, like everybody else knew something that I didn't know yet. Yeah. And I was always worried. So, you know, I would take my books home with me and spend a lot of time, uh, you know, worrying and a lot of time uh, revising notes. Um, now I can enter the classroom and, or start a semester with a lot more confidence. Right. But that is because I put in a lot of time earlier in my career as a grad student and then in my first couple of years. Um, so less time doing prep work now, more time grading or, or, or giving a evaluative comments and feedback. Right. So we were kind of talking about, or you mentioned earlier that, you know, you spend a lot of time running mm -hmm. and things like that, uh, not as much in the classroom. So um, with a job like this, it's not necessarily a nine to five, you know, it doesn't just at five o'clock, you just punch the clock. Yeah. I think that's what they call it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't had a job like that either. <laughs> it's a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't punch the clock and, uh, you know, just leave it at home. It's something that, you know, you're always thinking about, thinking about those lesson plans, thinking to have that stack of papers that you need to grade, but you also like to get out. I guess, how does this job work with your life balance now in, in doing things like you're talking about? Your, yeah. your, your uh, desires to like kind of be outside exercising, things like that. And um, has that evolved from those early days? Yes. I think a lot of people um, enjoy a career at the university uh, in the classroom because of the flexibility. Mm -hmm. So they might, uh, you know, go teach a class at eight in the morning, go to a coffee shop and read and grade for a while, go for a walk, go for a run. I know colleagues who uh, tell me that, you know, they're up all night grading papers because uh, they don't sleep. So, you know, yeah. 2 a.m. is a great time to read. I don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, currently I, I kind of, treat it as a nine to five job, although I'm teaching classes at eight. So right. you know, eight. To, <laughs> um, so I'll come into the office, I'll do my reading and grading in the office. And I try to stay on campus while I'm doing work related things. And then when I go home, I'm done with work. Mm. And I made that decision a long time ago when my children were little, so that while I was playing with my kids, while I was, you know, sitting on the floor, building Legos, I wasn't also with the other hand flipping pages in a book or writing notes for class. I'd give my children, you know, the attention that I thought they needed. And I wasn't going to stay up all night grading. Um, I also, I mean, I don't do well with that. I need, I need a regular sleep schedule. Sure. So I set that boundary. I treat the office as, you know, as if it's a nine to five. Um, even though I am given the flexibility, I could take the papers home and grade them at home. I could, you know, take a long break in the middle of the day and then read all night. Um, and I try to do the the reading and the writing while I'm at work. Right. And so, yeah, when I go home, I go running and I'll, I, I'll go running an hour and a half a day. And on the weekends, I, I try to rock climb, mountain climb, hike, uh, take my family places and not worry about work. Right. Although it might be in the background of sure. my head. Sure. Um, um, my, my focus is on my family when I'm at home. Did that, I mean, for, for some people and maybe you are like this and it was, you know, a very, it was something you had to adapt to, but for certain people, there may not be that ability to kind of turn it off yeah, uh, a little bit like that. Do you think early on, I mean, I don't know how old your, your children are, but you've been here 11 years early yeah. on. Do you think you had that ability or is that something you had to adapt to? Or do you think you've always kind of had a, a, a bit of like that an innate ability to say, you know, I need to stop this and refocus here to be present with, with something else. Yeah. Adaptation for sure. Through my undergraduate years, school was all day, every day. So, you know, I, there were no weekends off. Yeah. I was doing homework every single day of the week and that felt normal. That's the way my wife was too. We were always studying and we were, we were dedicated to the undergraduate studies. We finished our undergraduate work around the same time. I started graduate school. She started full-time work. Mm -hmm. So I kept up that same schedule of, you know, spending weekends reading and writing, keeping up with uh, my, my schoolwork. And she had those weekends free. And that's when we start to notice like, oh, we're now we're living different lives. Yeah. And then like even through, so I did a master's degree in Fairbanks, Alaska, and my wife was working her first job ever and developing her career, first full-time job. And developing her career while I was, you know, still studying. 
Then we moved to Idaho for more graduate school. And then we, and we had small children at the time. And that's where, like, I started to notice that when I was at home trying to read, right. then I had kids who wanted to be, uh, you know, on my lap playing. And it was hard. Like, I'd get really frustrated with, you know, sometimes with my studies, sometimes with my kids. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to be frustrated with my kids. This book can wait. My mm -hmm. kid can't. Right. So I would play with my kids while they were awake, put them to bed, and then I'd stay up all night doing homework. So, you know, I had some of those long sleepless nights uh, in my 20s, you know, while my children were young, trying to keep up with homework. And then, of course, waking up with babies through the night. And I think it's somewhere, you know, in my 20s that I learned that I, you, you can't go without sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so that, like the more the more sleep you lose, the more you realize like this isn't a healthy option. So start to draw those boundaries of like, all right, I can put the books away. I have my whole life to catch up on reading. Mm -hmm. I have my whole life to develop as a writer, but these kids aren't going to be here forever. My oldest is uh, graduating from high school this year. Oh, so, okay. And then my youngest turned 10 yesterday. So that's that's the range I've got, 17 to 10 right now. Awesome. Happy birthday. Yeah. And uh, so, it yeah, it developed. But uh, there, there was also this time – so I graduated – in 2008, right when the economy tanked, oh, yeah. and I applied to like 90 academic jobs, and I applied to like something like 200 plus jobs overall, and got no response from anybody. And then uh, my wife said, "I'll apply for a job." She applied to a job and got it. So I was home with the kids. Yeah. And so that was that. That was like a, a major change in perspective, as well as I went from being very, very busy with work and school to being very, very busy with the kids. And yeah, so that, that kind of changed my idea about work too. So yeah. yeah, suddenly my work was my kids and they they were full time all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's almost in a way, it's kind of nice that you had something that important to take the place of work. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause I know for myself, after I graduated from grad school, I kind of like didn't know what to do with myself in the downtime for yeah. a little bit, you know, like yes. even if we were visiting family, if there was an hour or so, like my mind would go instantly to, all right, I need to go find a coffee shop, open up this computer, read some journal articles, hammer out part of a paper. That That's just where my, that's where my mind was. For, yeah. For you, you feel kind of guilty if you have free time. Exactly. Like, uh -oh. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh oh, I'm that's, doing something wrong. That's the exact <laughs> feeling. And so, um, uh, luckily or unfortunately, I have a pretty great off switch. Um, I can I can definitely refocus on things that I want to give me uh, a little bit more pleasure or you know kind of fulfillment in my day to day, day, -to -day and, and I kind of know what those things are. It definitely took a little bit to to make that transition and and to have that refocus though a little bit as well and to and to kind of also have that thing of you've been working a long time towards something putting out 200 that's a lot of that's a lot of jobs to apply to applications take a long time yeah i mean that was a full-time job in itself that's another kind of mental for me it would be a hurdle to, to get over a little bit oh is, yeah it is is i put in all this work and time and now i'm i'm staying at home yeah um, was that something that you struggled with and how'd you deal with it uh yes i struggled with it yeah, well, I, I guess I, that's when I became a long distance runner. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so after putting in you know hours uh, with the kids, right, and and uh, one of them was in school, and one of them was uh, was was still very small. So, you know, there was still nap time in there, so I could still apply to jobs. I could still try to do some reading and writing. But yeah, otherwise I, I'm just dealing with you know this economic recession mm -hmm. where you know the reply to the jobs I applied to was that job doesn't exist anymore. Sorry, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I'm I'm feeling like I've failed in that regard. But I'm trying to say that's all right. I've got you know children that I'm going to take care of, and I'll I'll succeed here. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Raising children is a game that feels like like uh, no matter how hard you work at it, you don't feel like you're succeeding <laughs> <laughs> because there's always somebody crying. And so uh, when my wife would get home from work, I, I would go running. And uh, I got better and better at going farther and far, farther. So, uh, you know, I, I ran a marathon. It was the first race I ever ran because I could go out and run for an hour. Then I could run for two hours and yeah. I could run for three hours. And I think that it was good because I could shut parts of my brain off, the parts that are worrying about this and that, like, what should I, you know, 
what should I do with all this downtime? What should I do with all this quiet time? And just focus on developing my body, yeah. developing my ability to run, my endurance. And so running helped a lot. Running was therapeutic and it gave me kind of a win when, you know, career looked like it wasn't going to launch. Uh, parenting was a challenge, but I'm like, well, I can, I can run and that's healthy and that's good for me. And so I'll feel good about this. That's great perspective. That's awesome. I hope so. <laughs> um, no, I think so. And I think that that's, you know, I mean, that was kind of what I, maybe something I was pushing towards with that question is like, you know, during that time with those, maybe feeling with like setbacks and those huge changes in your life, uh, you know, thinking about how, how did you overcome in kind of like a career sense, you know? And I think that that is what you were just talking about is as important to, to, to work, to, to kind of growing professionally is finding some kind of balance, something that's going to give you an outlet, something that's going to let you decompress and maybe have, you know, a little bit of Zen, you know, yeah. for a moment, you know, to kind of just clear your mind because that has to be a, a part, I think, of of our lives is, is that ability to to clear our minds and kind of reset and uh, finding like a healthy outlet is probably the best way to do it. Um, yeah. There's a lot unhealthier ways to, to go about trying to reset your <laughs> mind, obviously. But I mean, I find that, you know, in that's something that I think about in, in, a, in, in a career now is when am I going to have those times to go mountain biking? Because mm -hmm. I know that, you know, or skiing, because I know that, you know, when, when I'm descending, that is the time when I can't think of anything else. Yeah. I love running too, but sometimes I can just kind of keep thinking when I'm running, <laughs> yeah. know, like, and then I don't actually maybe escape, um, the work or the family, you know, thoughts and in, intruding. Yeah. But if I have a moment, um, for me, what I have found is, you know, being on a mountain bike, I, I mean, I love going up and across, but going down for those 10 minutes, you have to be completely present. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to crash and it's going to hurt. And so. Yeah. There is nothing else that can intrude in that time for your, for your own safety. And yeah. I find after that 10 minute descent or skiing, doing the same thing, just having to be completely present going down, you know, rock tree, you know, a yeah. thing I can fall off here at the end of that. It's just, it's like, it's refreshing. It's been wiped clean a little bit. Yeah. So I do like really appreciate you talking about that. Cause I think it's something so important for people to think about in their jobs. What, what do you have that's going to allow you that, that little kind of reset, that, that time to come back refreshed, things like that. Yeah, I agree. You have kind of talked about with that flexibility is probably something that you like about your job as it affects your, your life outside of your job, right? Yeah. As, as a lecturer, you have the ability to go for a run midday. What do you get the most kind of satisfaction, fulfillment out of, of your job as it pertains to your job? Like... What do you love about your job? That's a difficult qu question, I think. Uh, when, I've, when I first started working with, like, developing writers, so I, as an undergraduate, I was a writing tutor. And that was a great job for me. At the school I attended, it was an internship, so I had to take a class, and then I had to apply for it, and then I got this position where I was mentored, and then it was just a job. I loved working one-on-one -on -one with people with something that, like, this is terrible, I hate it, I struggle. And I had no investment in the assignment, so I could read it and I could say like, oh, look, here's some difficult parts here. Here's some difficult parts here. And we could talk and then I could see the lights go on and someone go, oh, thank you. You know, they fi they'll figure things out. Mm -hmm. And that was a very rewarding experience. And that was one of those things that led me to think like, oh, I could teach writing mm -hmm. because I like seeing people get it. I like, I like them, you know, see like, here's this thing I don't like. Never mind. I like it. It's better than I thought. Um, and, and that's the way a lot of people approach writing. You know, I think a lot of people see writing as like, that's something I would like to be good at. But some people are good. Some people aren't. Oh, well. I say, no, no, no. Everyone can be good at it, but it is hard work. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out how to put in that hard work. Right. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed seeing people improve. I enjoyed seeing people um, feel like they understood something that before didn't seem understandable. Um, so that was part of what, I, what drew me to it. Mm -hmm. When I first got a full-time job teaching, right? So it wasn't just one class, it was four classes and it wasn't, right. you know, and I, I was talking to my dad about it and he said, well, how's the job going? I said, 
it's a lot harder than I thought. He says, that's why it's called work. <laughs> so that's why they pay you to do it. Right. You know, so going into it thinking like, oh, I loved it so much when it was one-on-one -on -one, or I loved it so much when it was one class. Like, oh, I don't know if I like it anymore. It's so much. You, you've got to find out, all right, you know, work is a challenging thing, a difficult thing. That's why somebody pays you to do it. If, right. if it were so wonderful, then they wouldn't have to pay anybody. Yeah. But I, I think it still has some of those same rewards. You can see more students who uh, start to grasp difficult ideas. But, of course, with that comes with the students who are disengaged or bored who are like, yeah, 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 I know what you English teachers are doing and I'm not into it. I don't care. I don't mm -hmm. want to be a good writer. And so you see more of the students who don't care. And, and it's, that's one of the big drawbacks, right? More students who are you know, loving it and more students who are struggling with it or hating it or who are bored, who don't want to take a class. Right? They're in there because they have to be. But I get to have... I get to be in control of the conversation for a certain yeah. part of each day, you know, and I get to say, hey, here's this new writer. Here's this new idea. Have you thought about this? And that's a lovely part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. Even if some students are like, ah, I don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I tell myself that's OK. They'll come back to it at some other point in life and, and, and discover it. Not everybody's going to be at the same moment at the same time. But having the opportunity, hey, here's this writer whose ideas I think are, are beautiful, are helpful, are challenging, and seeing some people go like, oh, yeah, that's an idea I haven't thought of before. Oh, that's a struggle I didn't know other humans were having. Help them care and, and you know discover something new is still one of the rewards. Although a teacher has to be patient yeah. for those. It's definitely not every day and right. it's definitely not every week. And sometimes it's not even every semester. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, my mentality is if I helped one student this week with anything, <laughs> that's like, I, I yeah. feel like I was a, I did, I did a good job for the week. Um, Cause you just don't know a lot of the times either. Yeah. You know, it's hard to gauge. Why is English important? You know, like, uh, you know, yeah. it's like, it, you know, I think reading and writing are important. It's one of those, uh, I, I don't know, I'll probably have the cliche answer of, uh, we're, you know, sharing ideas through time and space, right? You might have a good idea right now and somebody may not know what your good idea is until 20 years later. That's what we discover with a lot of writers. Mm -hmm. Hey, here's this person 100 years ago who, yeah. whose point of view matters. Uh, I think that students need to know their voice matters. Um, they might be struggling to find what their voice is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to take some work, right? But teaching them that their, their voice matters and then helping them discover, here's all these other voices that you may not have heard that matter. And I want you to enter into a conversation with them. Bring their ideas into your conversation, right? So it's, you know, exchange of ideas. Uh, I think that if we can improve our communication yeah. <laughs> across the divides, right, then, you know, hopefully we can have a better society. We can be better problem solvers. I try to tell my students... Look at writing as problem solving, you know, and if we look at uh, like contemporary political disputes, say we can split up into groups and say, here's what this group thinks, here's what that group thinks. But we can all say, what's the problem that mm -hmm. we're trying to solve? How can we solve that problem? How can good writing help us solve that problem? Yeah. How can good writing break down the barriers between different groups of people and help them uh, come together? And even, you know, still we might disagree. But um, at least we can stop shouting at each other. And yeah, I think that's a great. I think that's a great perspective again on you know the bigger picture of why is English one on one. Like, well, it can help heal some of these communication divides. So for yourself, what was the road to English for you? I guess you know going back a little ways. What when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, for a long time, I uh, I just wanted to be a lawyer like my dad, and really? and he he'll he'll remind me of that still. Remember when you wanted to be a lawyer? Uh, what, one of my brothers did become a lawyer, so, but he'll always bring that up to me. Uh, somewhere late, you know, somewhere in I think junior high or high school, uh, is when I got into reading, mm -hmm. and I loved reading so much. Reading brought me a lot of joy, um, so I thought I want to be a writer. So it, it wasn't um, I want to be an English major. I want to be an English teacher. It was I want to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And I remember in 11th grade, we had to take this writing test. It was like the national assessment. And, you know, it had this like top secret question. And one day you'd show up, they'd give you the question, you'd have to write an essay, and then you were going to be judged on it. And the question my year was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, oh, I want to be a writer. Like it came right to me. And then I thought, if I write 
an essay about wanting to be a writer, but I do a bad job. <laughs> That's terrible. That's like way worse. I'll get a bad score. So I wrote like this bogus essay about how I wanted to be a brain surgeon. And I got a totally average score. And I felt really conflicted about that. I was like, well, I'm not a writer. But it, it was a, a topic that intrigued me. Like, How do you become a writer? Where mm. do ideas come from? And so I took like a a literature class in 12th grade and we read very challenging books and I thought, okay, this is what I like. Mm -hmm. I want to know how to become that kind of person who has these great big ideas and who can share them in stories. And uh, I, I thought English was, you know, majoring in English, majoring in literature would be the path to, to getting there. Mm -hmm. Does that, did you kind of hold that path the whole way? You were always kind of working towards being a writer. How did things evolve? Did you? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> still, still looking for it. English as a major ends up being kind of divided, right? You can study literature, which is that's the, those are the people I love to read. Mm -hmm. um, but they, the literature teachers often say, oh, we're not teaching you how to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And then you could major in creative writing. I um, mean, they're like, we're going to teach you how to be a writer. But they'll just say, okay, just start writing. Like, oh, no, could, tell me how to do that first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, uh, and so for me, I felt like, okay, I, I can't figure this out. So I studied literature and then I'll take these writing classes on the side. Yeah. So still kind of like negotiating a path. Right. <laughs> and then you find out that there's all these great writers in the world who, you know, decided to be a writer and then just started writing like, oh, yeah, I didn't know that's, I, I didn't know that's what it took. Right. Uh, uh there's a neighbor brother song that I love to quote. Because uh, I love the idea, but I also find it problematic. They say, decide what to be and go be it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah, just decide and then go do it, right? And and you see that there's a certain number of writers in the world that have done that, right? right. They just decided to be a writer, sat down and started writing, and wow, good job. Sure. <laughs> and then there's other people who study it their whole life. And they're like, I'm not sure if I'm a writer yet. And I think that there is that kind of balance, right? And I think it, like looking for a career, it's that way too. Like do you just go out and grab hold of that career? You decided that's what you wanted to do? Or do you uh, – kind of wait for it to come to you? Do you send out a bunch of applications and see if anybody thinks you're good enough? And I think it ends up being kind of a mix. Right. And there may be yeah. kind of a, a spectrum there between those two. Sure. And, you know, there can be, try it. Give it a try. Take some of those classes, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, maybe, yeah, dive in pretty deep, but don't hold on to it like it's the only thing. Like yeah. if it's not working out, if there's too much math involved for you to be an engineer, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe there's something else for you that's just adjacent to it, right? Mm -hmm. Something like ideas like that. But I mean, yeah, I love that idea too. Like, oh, you want to be it? Just go do it. You know, that's yeah. great. What's stopping you? <laughs> right, be great. Go be great. But there's, I mean, yeah, I think that there's a lot more gray area possibly than that. And I think that, you know, we have an opportunity, especially in college to experience and to kind of test out a lot of different things yeah. and, and to kind of see like, can I do that? Or, you know, did that, like, even if I failed, did that feel awesome? Yeah. Right. Did it feel right? Even if I failed. Um, so going back a little bit to what I opened with as a, someone, do you still write some for yourself? Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, I write and publish essays now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, over the last years I've published with Idaho magazine. Okay. I found a way to combine all the, you know, I've written about running. Right. <laughs> about, okay. So yeah, I've written about skiing. I've written about uh, mountain climbing. Nice. These are all my favorite things. Yeah. I should read these. But yeah, one of my, my, my question was going to be going back to what I opened with, with that, that English professor who stopped by. Do you feel like these experiences have helped develop you as a writer? like going out and doing things. As he was saying, you know, we'd like to send our English students out to do conservation work, to, to have an experience, to develop them as a writer. Do these things, do you think, have they helped kind of like develop a perspective for you or? Yes. Your voice, I guess, going back to what we were talking about. Yeah, I think one of the limitations I faced just personally as a student of writing is I thought that if I just studied the topic writing long enough, I would be a writer and then I'd know what to mm -hmm. write about. And then what I end up writing about is like my leisure activities, right. like the stuff I'm doing for fun on the weekends. So I had, I'm like, oh, I was, all, I was already going hiking. I didn't know I could just write about that. So yeah, it, it took me a while to, to recognize what was allowable, what mm. I could do. And so I don't write, you know, I don't end up writing about academic topics. Right. And that might've been a limitation I created for myself was if I study writing too long, what can I write about? Well, I can only write about writing. 
or write about teaching, which wasn't very interesting to me. So yeah. so I, I floundered, right? But but when uh, I thought, well, I could I could write about the stuff I like to do. Yeah. <laughs> I could write about you know climbing this mountain or failing to climb a mountain or going running. Then I thought, well, I, I'm going to tell people about that anyway. Right. So why don't I write it down? And that's where you've had success. That's where I've had success. Which yeah. is kind of interesting going back to that high school essay. Yeah. <laughs> maybe if you've written about something you're actually interested in, if you would have written about being a writer, maybe that intrinsic interest would have yeah. floated to the top. Yeah. And I want, and well, at the time though, I, you know, I wasn't writing anything. Sure. So it's also one of those things that like, uh, you, you know, I think, am I, am I a writer? Yes, I'm a writer. That's what I want to be. Okay, what have I written? Uh, I, I write notes in a journal that I don't show anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm not a writer if I'm not sharing it, right? So, yeah, I think that, like, okay, what makes a person a writer? Well, they, they write. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the s silliest things that I observe about my own life is, so one of my professors, again, this mentor in Fairbanks, uh, I noticed everywhere he went, he carried a big blank book and when he'd sit down and open it up and just start writing wherever we were and he's talking to you he's writing he's teaching a class he's writing i thought oh he's he's a writer because he actually just sits and writes everywhere mm -hmm. he goes he sits and writes and so i thought well i can do that too now the reality is i'd had professors telling me that from the very beginning carry around a notebook and write right. and i thought oh, yeah sure whatever i'll write when i have a big idea yeah. and if i sit around waiting for a big idea then i have a blank notebook yeah. at home but yeah. if i carry on i just write everything Small ideas, big ideas, even just writing on the stuff I'm doing. I took a notebook, rafting down the middle fork of the Salmon River, and I just pull it out and start writing. We are currently floating down the middle fork of the Salmon River. I'm just describing what I'm doing. Then I don't have to worry about later, you know, staring at a blank page saying like, well, I'm going to wait here for inspiration to come. I'm like, well, let's see. Do I have anything in my notes I can steal? I can steal right. from myself. Um, so, yeah, just making myself understand all right if i'm if i want to be a writer i have to start writing something even if it's small even if it looks insignificant in the moment i better just start doing it awesome yeah. that's great advice i think for anyone interested in, in writing in yeah. any in any way just to wrap it up here uh do you have any kind of words of advice for career seekers whether they're you know starting out in college or mid-career uh, you know, at home with the kids thinking about what to do next. I don't know. I, I often feel like I'm not the person to take advice from because <laughs> I, I feel like I stumbled into my career kind of accidentally. You know, it was it was at some point after I decided, well, I guess I'm a stay at home dad. I'm not going to be teaching anymore that a job opportunity came up and that, you know, my wife and I talked it over and she's like, yeah, I think you should go for this. And like, oh, I, I thought I wasn't looking anymore. <laughs> and then, And suddenly I was back in the classroom. So I'd say, I guess, don't give up is, is, is good advice, even if you hear it all the time. Yeah. And then I think other advice is, you know, find that balance of patiently waiting, because I think careers are not always just a, a seek and grab kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? You have to patiently wait for yourself to develop the skills, to explore your interests, as I think you, you pointed out, right? Test this out. Does it work? If it doesn't, that's okay. That's not failure. Test out something else. Did that work? Test out something else. Because in the end, you know, I've pieced together my interest gained, you know, as a part-time summer firefighter for the government, mm -hmm. a class I took here at ISU, winter camping, mm -hmm. which was one of the coolest classes I ever took. And I, you know, I, for me, it was just play, but then it's ended up leading me to all sorts of great opportunities that I've ended up writing about. So, you know, be patient, develop skills slowly, but also look for those opportunities to reach out and grab a hold of something and recognize that I think it takes kind of both, like yeah. slowly developing skills and interests and also reaching out and, grab a, and grabbing hold of opportunities when you notice them or creating opportunities if you're not finding them. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, thanks for coming in today. Yeah. Thank you. And that was our conversation with Michael. I find it very interesting that he did kind of dive right in to to what he wanted to be, to what he, he knew he wanted to be from a young age. And he just kind of kept swimming towards that. And given the, the, the obstacles, the self-doubt, the, the times of setbacks, what he's always kind of doing is developing another part of himself that in turn 
was going to help him reach his goals eventually. If you're interested in your career pathway and how to reach your goals, feel free to visit the ISU Career Center website at isu.edu backslash career. Likewise, if you're interested in listening to any of our other guests on the show, you can find all of our past episodes on Spotify and YouTube, as well as KISU.org. Select episodes are played the second Wednesday of every month at 7.30 on KISU. From the ISU Career Center, this is Mark Weaver, wishing you a fantastic rest of your day.